Welcome to worship along with Faith Community Christian Reformed Church on this Lord's Day, June 7, 2020. It's good to worship again together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I'll ask you, where does your help come from? And the answer, of course, is our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And he is the one who greets you with these words, grace and mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, let all God's people say, Amen. I want to remind you before we spend some time in prayer right now to commit to pray on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. That's a time we've covenanted together as a church to go before God for a few moments wherever we are in our homes or at work or wherever and spend a few moments in prayer to our God for our world, for our country, for our state and city, and uh, just for our church and for whatever we need to be praying about at that time, Wednesday evenings, 7 p.m. Let's go to our God in prayer at this time. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you because you are the God who has made us, you are the God who has made this world and we so love you for making such a beautiful world for us. Thank you for who you are. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as you have revealed yourself to us. You are the God who has created. You are the God who has redeemed us in love. And you are the God who sanctifies us through and through by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that. Thank you, God, that uh, even in a time like this, when so much is going on in our nation right now, so many things with the coronavirus and also the racial tension going on. We've seen so much and we pray to you for you are the God of all nations. We praise you that in Jesus Christ, the barriers that have separated humanity are torn down. And yet we confess ourselves, our own slowness to open our hearts and minds to people of other lands and tongues and races. Deliver us from the sins of fear and prejudice and other racial sins, Lord, that we may move toward the day when we all are truly one in Jesus Christ. And we trust you, Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you hear our prayer of confession right then you did, that you are truly God and at the same time truly human and truly righteous in Jesus Christ. So we know you are the mediator who has given was given to us to set us completely free and to make us right with you, Lord. By the power of Christ's divinity, you bore the weight of God's anger in your humanity, Lord. We, you restored us to righteousness and to life. Thank you for this gift of salvation in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness and grace you offer to us. Lord, we lament now what has gone on this week. We know it's so hard for imperfect human beings to fix something so ingrained in people, so ingrained as race and color of skin. And so we cry out to you for you to intervene spirit supernaturally, to bring an end to the bitterness that people feel towards each other for who they are and for what has transpired over this last week and weekend. We cry out to you for your power and grace to renew us so that we can be agents of renewal ourselves in this world, in small ways and in large ways. Heal us, Lord, repair the brokenness, turn things around and show your might. Answer us, we pray, as we lament the tragic loss of life over the last week or so, the destruction of property, and the backward movement of race relations in our country. Hear our cries of lament in these next few moments of silence. Our cries go up to you, Lord. We know you hear us. We trust you. And we confess that you are our help, for you have created this world. Please help us. Help those who are sick and hospitalized and grieving, those who are political leaders and frontline medical personnel and first responders 
and those law enforcement folks who are in harm's way. Lord, we pray for our servicemen too. Lord, we pray for our African-American brothers and sisters. We pray for those who have lost their jobs, their ability to produce income. We pray for our elderly folks who are so isolated at this time. We pray for anyone who feels so alone in all the things going on. We pray for those who are persecuted for the sake of your name. Lord, protect them all. Give them all wisdom. Give them all strength. Give them all stamina. Give them all grace. And Lord, we pray for peace for this world. We pray for peace, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'd like to continue a series of messages that we've been moving in the, on the Heidelberg Catechism. We're up to Lord's Day 14. We'll be reading that in just a moment. But first, some words from Scripture, words from the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the first part, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the first part. So we read these words there, Genesis 1, 26a and 27a. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And then 27a, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then from the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 14, questions and answers 35 and 36. I'll read the question if you have this before you on the screen. I think you could say the answer while I say it. What does it mean that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? The answer, that the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature, so that he might become David's true descendant, like his brothers in every way, except for sin. Question 36, how does the holy conception and birth of Christ benefit you? The answer, he is our mediator, and with his innocence and perfect holiness, he removes from God's sight my sin, mine since I was conceived. <clears throat> Well, friends, at the very beginning of this message, I'm going to be reading an extended uh, reflection by Max Lucado, a prolific writer and a pastor, and um, he wrote something in relation to the racial tensions going on in our country right now, something I read and I thought, wow, that needs to be shared in this message today. And it is uh, very much preachable, so I will preach these words from Max Lucado as if they are my own, but they are not my own, they are his. And then I'll go into some of my own thoughts on this text and on these questions and answers as well. <clears throat> Beloved in Christ, Lucado writes, Recent racially charged incidents, including the tragic death of George Floyd, have stirred ensuing riots and torn open the rawest of wounds, racism. Judging a person according to skin color is an ancient sin. For that reason, God gave this ancient solution. In the earliest words of scripture, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. From Genesis chapter 1, 26, out of the message paraphrase. Embedded in these words, friends, is the most wonderful of promises. God made us to reflect his image. No one is a god except his in his or her own delusion. 
but everyone carries some of the communicable attributes of God. Wisdom, love, grace, kindness, a longing for eternity. We are made in his image. Sin has distorted this image, but it has not destroyed it. Our moral purity has been tainted. Our intellect is polluted by foolish ideas. We have fallen prey to the elixir of self-promotion rather than God promotion. The image of God is sometimes difficult to discern. But do not think for a moment that God has rescinded his promise or altered his plan. He still creates people in his image to bear his likeness and reflect his glory. Pop psychology is wrong when it tells you to look inside yourself and find your value. The magazines are wrong when they suggest you are only as good as you are thin, muscular, pimple-free, or perfumed. The movies mislead you when they imply that your value increases as your stamina, intelligence, or net worth does. Religious leaders lie when they urge you to grade your significance according to your church attendance, self-discipline, or spirituality. According to the Bible, you are good simply because God made you in his image, period. He cherishes you because you bear a semblance to him, and you will only be satisfied when you engage in your role as an image bearer of God. Such was the view of King David. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness, Psalm 17, verse 15. How much sadness would evaporate if Every person simply chose to believe this. I was made for God's glory and am being made into his image. Would you let this truth find its way into your heart? You were conceived by God before you were conceived by your parents. You were loved in heaven before you were known on earth. You are not an accident. You aren't a random fluke of genetics or evolution. You aren't defined by the number of pounds you weigh, followers you have, or car you drive, or clothes you wear. You are made in God's image. Print that on your resume. You are a diamond, a rose, and a jewel purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, you are worth dying for. Would you let this truth define the way you see yourself? Would you let this truth define the way you see other people? Every person you see was created by God to bear his image. Every person you see and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. This means that all people deserve to be seen for who they are, image bearers of God. Imagine the impact that this promise would have upon the society that embraced it. What civility it would engender. What kindness it would foster. Racism will not flourish when people believe their neighbor bears God's image. The fire of feuds will have no fuel when people believe their adversaries are God's idea. Will a man abuse a woman? Not if he believes she bears the stamp of God. Will a boss neglect an employee? Not if she believes the employee bears a divine spark. Will society write off the indigent, the mentally ill, the inmate on death row, or the refugee? Not if we believe, truly believe, that every human being is God's idea, and he has no bad ideas. Parents and grandparents understand the implications of this truth. I recall when my daughter Jenna was pregnant with our first grandchild. She was round as a ladybug long before Jenna gave birth to Rosie. I loved our granddaughter. I'd never seen her, but I loved her. She'd done nothing to earn my love, but I loved her. 
She'd never brought me coffee or called me papa. She'd never sung me a song or danced me a dance. She'd done nothing. Yet I loved her already. I would do anything for her. And that's not hyperbole. Why? Why did I love her so? Because she carries some of me in her. A small part for sure, but a part of me nonetheless. Why does God love you with an everlasting love? It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with whose you are. You are his. How can we respect our neighbors? What is God's solution to angry racism that gives birth to violence and bloodshed? Government programs might help. Lectures might enlighten. But in the end, God's plan is the only plan. See every person on the planet as God's idea. And he has no bad ideas. Indeed, beloved, <clears throat> as Lucado reminds us in that reflection, God has no bad ideas, none whatsoever, including the idea from his perfect and infinite mind that to deal with our sin, including the sins of racism, so much in the news these days, to deal with the sins of human beings, God's plan includes sending his son to remove our sin from God's sight to redeem us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We are created in God's image. That image is tainted by our sin, and God in his perfection sees fit to send his son to take on a fully human nature. Word become flesh. The second person of the Trinity comes to us in the person, a real live person, of Jesus Christ. Jesus who miraculously is conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. As the Apostles' Creed states it, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, divinity, and born of the Virgin Mary, humanity. Humanity was created in God's image, and God took on that humanity, that human nature. And of course, God in Jesus Christ got it right. He lived the perfect life. He was sinless in every way like us, like his brothers and sisters, except for sin. Hebrews 2.17 tells us he was fully human in every way. And yet Hebrews 4.15 tells us he did not sin. He lived the perfect holy life that people made in God's image are supposed to live. He did it. In Jesus Christ, fully divine, fully human, with a 100% divine nature and a 100% human nature, that's Jesus. God in Jesus took on the human flesh of human beings who were created in God's image, but who had tainted God's image in them. And Jesus got it exactly right. Not one racist action, deed, word, behavior, attitude, or thought in him, and no other sin either. And God's good idea was to send Jesus to cover our sins, to redeem us from our sins, to remove our sins from God's sight, from his sight, how did he do this? His good idea to restore the image of God and humanity was that Jesus, in living the perfect life, obeying God's law perfectly, getting everything exactly right, perfectly holy, would fulfill God's requirements, his expectations of us, by his life and his obedience. And then in death, by crucifixion, he took on every sin ever committed. He took on everything we don't get right. He took upon himself every sin, which includes everyone's racist actions, deeds, words, behaviors, attitudes, and thoughts. Those were all placed on him. And he suffered the punishment that we had coming to us because of all those sins. 
and it was an eternal punishment, an infinite suffering. He endured that for the sins of all humanity, for everyone who has messed up God's image in them by their sin. That's everyone. And what that means is, as the Catechism says it, he removed from God's sight my sin, sin that has been mine since I was conceived as a human being. He removed from God's sight your sin, sin that has been yours since you were conceived as a human being. God's good idea was that Jesus could do this because he lived the perfect holy life as a human being with a human nature, and his perfect holiness stands in for our imperfection and our unholiness so that God can see Jesus in our place. And God's good idea was that even though we could never pay for our own sin, it's too great, the punishment infinite, still a human being had to pay that price. And Jesus was fully human. So again, he could stand in for us, human for human, so that God can see Jesus in our place on the cross. And God's good idea was that because Jesus was fully divine, he could endure, even unto death, an eternal, infinite punishment against sin. Every sin, that is, that was placed on him. Jesus could endure that because he was fully divine. He was the only one who could remove from God's sight my sin and yours. Because he was the only one who could take the punishment. And when he proclaimed, it is finished while hanging on the cross, that mediating work of redeeming us from sin back to God was finished. Fully human, born of the Virgin Mary, fully divine, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was a mediator between human beings and God, humanity and divinity. He played both roles Perfectly, He mediated redemption for us in the sight of God. He removed from God's sight my sin, your sin, our sin, since we were conceived. Removed from God's sight by the mediator. God's good ideas, creating us in his own, in his own likeness, in his own image, sending Jesus fully God, fully human, redeeming us from our sin by that mediator, Jesus, because we could never do it ourselves. And God's good idea also is this, that this is a reality for those who believe in Jesus as the one who did it, who saved them, who paid for their sins, believed in him. This is a reality for anyone who is a sinner. That's all of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe? It's a reality. God forgives our sins because of Jesus Christ, and he will do so for all those who repent, who confess their sins, trusting in Jesus as their Savior. It's a reality. All who believe are forgiven. It's a reality that this can be anyone if they confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. This can be anyone if they come to Jesus and repent of their sins. Let's do an exercise, shall we? Put these in order of bad, worse, and worst. Number one, a police officer asphyxiating to death a person he is arresting by putting his knee on their neck. Number two, an Antifa rioter, destroying property, or looting, or setting fires, or even shooting and killing cops. Number three, a regular person who tries to stay out of trouble, but in his or her heart holds a few bad or not so nice attitudes about people of another skin color than themselves. What should be the worst of the three? Number one, number two, or number three? Well, perhaps it depends a bit on the color of your skin, how you answer that. 
or perhaps not. Perhaps it depends on whether you or one of your family members or friends works in law enforcement, or perhaps not. Perhaps it depends on what's going on in your own heart when you see people of skin color different than yours, or perhaps not. Oh, there are ramifications specific to each one. Of course there are. And there are consequences specific to each one. Of course there are. And there are lasting effects specific to each one. Of course there are. There are depths of suffering specific to each one. Of course there are. Well, God's good idea is that anyone, anyone, who is part of any one of those three, anyone who confesses their sin and cries out to Jesus for forgiveness, their sin is removed from God's sight. It is forgiven. It is paid for because Jesus is their mediator now and God sees Jesus in their place. And that is true for that police officer in prison right now. And that is true for any Antifa member who will be caught, arrested, and punished for destruction. And that is true for anyone who holds a single racist thought deep and hidden in their hearts. There still may be civil punishment, prison, paying of debt to society. Absolutely, that is as it should be. But for the one who repents who cries out for Jesus to save them, their sin is removed from God's sight. And God sees Jesus in their place because of God's good idea, sending Jesus fully and perfectly one of us, human, and fully divine, too. And finally, for those who have cried out for Jesus in repentance, God says, now that you're forgiven, now that I see my son Jesus in you, you start acting and speaking and thinking the way that one who is created in my image is supposed to act and speak and think. And you start treating every single person I have created, no exceptions based on color or gender or race or whatever, no exceptions as if they also have been created just like you have in my image because they have been too. And that was my good idea. That's what God tells us today. That's what God tells every racist from one who has killed because of their racism, all the way to one who has the tiniest little racist attitude hidden in their hearts because of racism. Bad, worse, worst. There's no sense us ranking them. Oh, they'll all be ranked by our civil laws and authorities as they should be. But ultimately... In the ultimate sense, there's no sense ranking them because they're all sin. And we're all sinners. But what a good idea. God giving us Jesus, our mediator, who removes from God's sight my sin. Mine since I was conceived. Yours too. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, every praise we can give goes to you for doing what you did for us. What a good idea. God sending his own son to remove from his own sight our sins and to do that for anyone, anyone, no matter what they've done, no matter what we've done, no matter how horrible it is or how hidden you went to the cross. And no matter who cries out for saving, no matter who repents, no matter what, you are ready to cover their sin, our sin, as a full
fully human, fully divine mediator by your precious blood shed on the cross, shed for all those who are made in your image. That's all of us. So this good idea is available to every last person, no matter what color their skin is. Because of this idea, we lift up every praise to you for it. Every praise is to our God. We sing hallelujah. For Jesus' sake, let all God's people say, Amen. Beloved in Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation tells us that there will come a day and there will be a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's the mediator, Jesus. Wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus. That's not an angry mob. That's the bride of Christ. That's not a bunch of rioters. That's the church victorious. And the only thing on their mind that day is not color or race or division, but a unified song of salvation to their God, the one whose image they all bear. And surely God will be blessing them as he blesses us with grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Let all God's people say, Amen.